Namaste. So last time, I ran out of time before I could give the second example. And the second example is from Bhagavad Gita. The first spiritual instruction that Krishna gives to Arjuna, huh? he says, why are you lamenting? You're crying over something that's not worthy of tears. The wise lament neither for the living nor the dead. And then he begins to explain this. Huh? And the way it's usually translated is, the spirit soul <laughs> in the body uh, is not subject to death and like that. So, uh, wait a minute. Then later on, Krishna goes, why would anybody who is self-realized kill or cause anyone else to kill? But then finally, he says, Arjuna, you should fight this war <laughs> and wipe everybody out. That's what I want you to do. So, like, what is this? How is it possible? Is Krishna contradicting himself? Well, let's go back to the original source. What does Krishna actually say? He says, Dehino smin yata dehe. Jovanam jara. That the embodied, the one who is embodied, Dehinaha. Dehinaha doesn't specify what type of being we're talking about at all. It just says the one who is embodied. But different schools translate it in different ways. Some, as the dualistic schools, for example, translate it as the soul, the eternal soul. <laughs> Others, such as the uh, Buddhists and the uh, Raja Yogins and people like that, they translate it as the self with a capital S, the embodied self. For example, Shankara. And then others, simply like Zen masters and so on, simply deny the whole thing and say, that's impossible. None of that really exists. Neither the body, nor the world, nor the soul, nor the self, nor nothing, nothing really exists. So here are all these people who are supposed to know the truth, <laughs> arguing over the interpretation of this verse, which is like the basic, basic, basic beginning of all spiritual instruction. So how is this possible? Are, does that mean one of them is right and all the rest are wrong? Does it mean that one interpretation is true and the others are untrue? Huh? Does it mean they're all untrue? What does it mean? Well, what it means is that the truth is not just the truth. Just like we talked about last time. Just because you can abstract a general solution to a scientific experiment, huh? And then you find that it's not actually true in any specific instance of the experiment. Huh? There's always some noise. <laughs> actually, what it is is other things that are interfering. Because it's impossible to isolate anything fully. In the same way, in this passage, what we're seeing is Krishna is telling the truth. Krishna is a divine incarnation. He's fully self-realized by nature. Huh? He can't say anything that's not true. But yet, what he's saying is subject to interpretation. And so different people interpret it differently according to their point of view. 
And what is a point of view? A point of view is a context, right? It's a set of background knowledge and assumptions, a set of terminology and meanings. Well, basically what we call an ontology. An ontology is like a background that allows you to make sense of your foreground, huh? the context that gives the meaning to the content. So Krishna is not trying to confuse Arjuna. <laughs> He's trying to clarify him. But what happens is, according to their level of spiritual insight, different interpreters give it different meanings according to their background ontology and views. Now, I want to reference our series on the esoteric teaching. I think it's called Introduction to the Esoteric Teaching. And it's a playlist of four or five videos. You can easily go watch it. So I'm not going to recap the whole thing here. But basically, what I'm saying in that series is, or actually what Ramana Maharshi is saying in his book, uh, Upadesha Undiyar, and I simply abstracted it from there. And the same thing the Buddha is saying in his teaching on Paticca Samupada, to go even further back to our very beginning series. He's saying there are basically four levels of spiritual growth. There's a karma yoga, bhakti yoga, raja yoga, and jnana yoga. Okay, jnana yoga is full self-realization. Karma yoga is the beginning of the path. So any teaching, any spiritual truth, will have different meanings and different interpretations for the people on those four levels or stages of the path. It doesn't mean that it's true for some and untrue for others. It's true for all. But according to their point of view, they give it different meaning because they are coming from a different context. You see? The meaning and truth or untruth of any statement is always dependent on the context. I don't know how many times we've been over this. People still don't seem to get it. In other words, meaning, including truth or untruth, is relative. And that's why, as I mentioned last time, in Jain logic, you always have the disclaimer, in some ways, in some ways this statement is true. In some ways this statement is false. In some ways this statement is true and false. And in some ways this statement is neither true nor false. And in some ways it's inconceivable. <laughs> So Jain logic is quite a bit more sophisticated than our Western logic. And therefore, it's able to understand a greater breadth of knowledge and consciousness. So now, what about our statement that we're analyzing from Bhagavad Gita? Well, to the bhakti yogi, the embodied being is the individual soul. Now, bhakti yogis are mostly dualists. And to a dualist, you have this soul, this conscious, uh, willful, and karmically entangled being who is eternal, both in the future and in the past. When he becomes bewildered by the material energy, he becomes embodied. Dehinaha. And then when he becomes uh, enlightened, gets out of that entanglement, he goes to live with God in the spiritual world eternally. That's the theory. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but that's the context of bhakti. 
So he's going to interpret this statement of Krishna to indicate the embodied soul. Huh? Now then, there's the uh, the next one, which is the karma yoga, the bhakti yogi. I'm sorry, the first one I talked about is actually the karma yogi. See, there's a confusion between bhakti and karma yoga. Most what is called bhakti yoga is actually karma yoga because it's based on rituals and rules and regulations and so on. Whereas bhakti is actually the yoga of love. And love can't be regulated. Huh? Love can't be based on rules. <laughs> it can't be legislated. Huh? It can't be enforced. You can't say, well, uh, somebody chanted so many rounds of their mantra today, so uh, they're more advanced than somebody who chanted less. No, because love is spontaneous. Love is completely internal. So when the rituals and rules of karma yoga become fully internal, internalized, then it becomes bhakti. You see? So although in, in most cases the same theory is behind both karma yoga and bhakti yoga, in authentic bhakti yoga, it's not dependent on externals at all. It's completely internal. A person can look like an ordinary, regular guy, but because he has internalized the principles or realizations of bhakti, he can actually be in a high state of realization. And at the top of bhakti, one realizes, oh, actually, the object of my devotion is myself, with a capital S. In other words, God, whatever form of God you worship, huh, is actually an emanation from the self, which we call Ishwar. Ishwar means the controller. So the aspect of God that controls the material manifestation and who appears in that manifestation from time to time to renew the teaching of the actual truth is the uh, proper object of bhakti. So that can be uh, uh, an avatar like Krishna. It can be a god or goddess like uh, Shiva or Shakti. Uh, it can be a jnani, a fully realized being, like any of the great seven sages in the ancient days, uh, Vashishta uh, or Shukadev or Vyas uh, or even Janaka, the ancient kings, realized sage kings of old. They can be worshipped as God because they are of the same quality of God, having realized the truth. But anyway, if one worships one of those beings, realized beings, he sooner or later realizes, wait a minute, I am of the same quality. There's no difference between my object of worship and myself. And of course, that leads to the realization that there is only the self. So in the end, bhakti and jnana reach the same conclusion by different ways, by different paths. But each of them in the beginning stages is going to interpret this truth differently. Huh? And uh, I'm running out of time again. <laughs> so I'm going to have to leave off the description of Braja Yoga and Jnana Yoga until next time. So in the meantime, take a look around you and see who is in Karma Yoga, who is in Bhakti, who is in Raja Yoga, and who is in Jnana. That is the esoteric teaching. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Harihi Aum.